step into the latest installment of our rebroadcast series, podcast episode 60, titled Revelation 2022, portions featuring esteemed Christian speaker, Mike from COT on the End Generation Project. This episode originally aired on April 2, 2024, exclusively on counciloftime.com. In this episode, dive deep into discussions on end generation project ranging from biblical eschatology to overcoming addiction and alcoholism. We're privileged to deliver daily insights from Michael, one of the most important Christian voices of our time, who is renowned for his focus on end time prophecies and readiness. For more original content, please visit the Council of Time website linked below. We appreciate your patronage. End Generation Project is solely crowdfunded and ad-free. We are able to bring you great podcasts and talks around recovery and eschatology because of your support. Please watch for shout-outs and prayer requests to our latest members in this video. Check our description for information about that as well as our brand new merch store. I remember to subscribe, like, and share for daily excellence. We cherish your feedback and the incredible stories you share. Now, let's delve into today's podcast, Revelation 2022. Portions tune in to the rebroadcast of End Generation Project's podcast episode 60 with Mike from COT. Blessings to all. Good evening, everybody out there. You guys are so patient. My goodness. Well, good to be here with you guys today. And if I sound rested because I am. Thank God for that. I believe yesterday I could barely do anything. I was incredibly exhausted. And, uh, well, sometimes when you don't have brain power, right, you're forced to rest. And I did. All day. I think it was all day and half the day uh, Saturday. Amazingly. There's be enough sleep, though, for the rest of the week. We here at COT have a lot to go over. We have so much to go over. Guys, I was in the KD files, right? They're about to uh, release, of course. And I was going over some of the first, uh, some of the first files, some of the introductory files, and some of the investigations that uh, people will be able to read later on. They're in cycle investigations by the way but uh one of them was just absolutely creepy it was creepy right i'm gonna post it anyway of course but it's almost guaranteed to shake up the foundations of just about anybody but it does give you insight into this story of the fallen in fact the story of the fallen is the biggest story it's one of the biggest uh, subjects anybody could ever cover. It is prudent of an individual to make themselves acquainted with what the fallen are. Because you're dealing with a world that is constructed uh, essentially by them. I know that's not what people want to hear, but most of how you interact in the world is inspired by them. It is. But to know their true nature, well... That gives you an upper hand in this spiritual battle. Because that word spirit, uh, I know it would be nice if it meant it, we were dealing with beings in a total different dimension, right? Uh, but no. Spirit is a word that's referenced a lot, but all too often you're dealing with flesh and blood things, right? Uh, and it does make for... It sounds somewhat like science fiction sometimes, but for the most part, right? A lot of people are losing this spiritual battle because they don't understand the foe they're dealing with, not their immediate foe. And it would be a, a change for people to really begin to defeat their foe. I mean, really defeat their foe, right? Really defeat their foe, especially in this environment that we live in today. That's going to be in the KD Files. And I hope that you guys, uh, I hope that they are useful to your walk with the Lord, your walk of faith, your lives in general. But they're not meant to be scary, you know, all that stuff. We're not, 
I don't focus on those areas, but um, I hope that you guys learn quite a bit. I do. Which, that makes Enoch a very important book. It does. I know people dispute the book of Enoch. I do not. A uh, long time ago, I shared with you guys a brief history of the book of Enoch that I was introduced to, which really made that book a very different book. I do not, I do not read all versions of the book of Enoch. I know that some are uh, deeply tampered with, right? All of them essentially tell the same story, but sometimes man can't help himself but to embellish things that should not be embellished. Nevertheless, it's a very important book. It really does show you things. That, for example, ladies, makeup, right? Makeup and, and all these things. What do you think about something? Uh, don't be offended either. Because it's part of society. All of us are sinners, saved by grace, right? But makeup, in general, is to make you look better for somebody else. But for what purpose? Right? For what end goal does a person do that? Uh, tinctures, bracelets, rings, all that jewelry stuff. People have that as part of their culture. The beginning of that was an act of seduction, right? So that the female could have the upper hand on males. That's what it was for. Uh, so it all led back to uh, seduction is what it leads back to. Right? Now, in your hearts, you may not do it that way now. Fine, that's okay. But a long time ago, that's what it was based uh, from. A long time ago. And a lot of people, you know, they, they do specific things now with a specific reason to seduce or to attract the opposite side. Right? That's the way they do. Unfortunately, in this day and age, men do the same thing. Uh, all of it is an act of seduction. And believe it or not, anything outside of a sanctioned marriage is a form, a high form of witchcraft. And the KD files will also go over that too. So there are going to be a lots, lots of uh, things in the KD files that you can become familiar with, uh, which will actually help you. To help you because wouldn't it be awesome if people could return back to a state of innocence? That'd be an awesome thing, right? You wouldn't have any, um, you wouldn't have any barriers or hindrances regarding your faith, regarding your vision, sight, and spiritual things. Lord knows in this day we need it, right? As summer comes in, these hot temperatures are starting to come in. You guys are going to begin to see some of the uh, some of the ripple effects of a failing atmosphere, a failing. Actually, it's part of a change. I'm not going to say failing. I'm going to say part of a change, part of something that is somewhat seasonal, right? For example, some people are going to experience summer temperatures and winter weather uh, within a couple of days apart. Right? Don't be surprised if that same thing happens in the middle of July. Don't be surprised. We're going to have these uh, uh, cold days, hot days, bad weather conditions. Hail is becoming a problem. That's one of the major things they're trying to tie down right now is how much hail that uh, people are going to see. Oversized hail is what they're saying. So there is a great potential uh, for oversized hail. So make sure that you keep yourselves up to date on the weather, right? Make sure you do that. Um, I'm going to do my best to help you guys out as I go forward with some things. Unfortunately, as I said last week, we didn't quite make the deadline for activity in the heavens. And so that gives me a calendar from which to work. Right? I uh, always do things like that because I, wanna, I don't want to waste time, right? And I need things to be needful, useful, and relevant to you guys. And um, since we did fail, that puts our preparation clock uh, back a big degree. Which, in my opinion, we don't have that much time. Right? Don't let that scare you, though. Right? It's actually a wonderful thing. It is. 
Don't you guys think it's a wonderful thing to get this process over? Don't you think that the closer we come to the coming of the Lord, that that would motivate the average individual to give it all of what they have? I mean, give it everything. Full speed ahead, right? This is what we're looking at. Giving everything all of what we have, especially um, in these days. Now, a lot of people talk about the last days. They do. But not everybody believes we're in the last days. I personally believe we're in the last hours. I do not think we're going to have the time that most people are comfortable with. In fact, people are going to be caught unawares outside of a type of timing. Right? It's going to happen by, listen, let me give you guys something the Lord gave me. First, it'll begin with, because the Lord is a, he's good. We know we have people on this earth that are to pass. The first thing you're going to begin to notice in your small circles is that people you are acquainted with or people you know are going to start passing. We're talking about uh, uh, folks that you thought were would, would make it a bit longer, folks who are young enough, right? They're going to start passing a lot. That means a lot of people are going to be taken from the earth. Lots of people. We're going to be taken from the earth. A lot of people who are still messing around with different uh, substances and things. Well, it's almost like the Lord's going to give them over to whatever they desire to have. And so when they're given over to it, of course, that'll be their last time. And they'll be taken from the earth. So you're going to notice, you're going to notice a lots of people going. Now, after that. Of course, people become numb to things like that, right? After that, you're going to notice weather's going to start taking people left and right. God has been extremely merciful over the years concerning weather. With all these storms, with all these uh, happenings in the atmosphere, we have been, as humanity, we've been extremely blessed. There's been minimal life lost, right? Now you're about to see a lot of life lost by very unfortunate things, right? And it will seem bad, but I caution you not to read too much into it, all right? Um, keep in mind in this world, what men call right is absolutely wrong, and what men are calling wrong is absolutely right. Try not to get caught up in this rhetoric of the world that you find yourself in agreement with the world. Try not. Try not to do that. And please try not to do that. Try to keep yourselves stayed in the word of God to agree with what is holy, right? That we know we are in a political climate. A lot of people are going to be duped and they're going to be sucked into this political war and they will become casualties or servants of something very dark, right? So please keep yourselves, keep yourselves at all costs in faith. Never compensate for anything the world is doing, but seek holiness at all costs. The temptations are coming. And a person cannot be tempted if something is not in them. If something is in you, you will be tempted. Now, if you belong to Christ and you feel that temptation, listen to me. If God shows or exposes that temptation, it is because he's going to uproot it forever. All right? He will uproot it. All right? Uh, keep that in mind. Now, here's, here's the biggest piece of advice I can give you. Do your best to follow Christ. Don't do your best to follow Christ like me or anybody else, but do your best within your knowledge base to follow Christ and always seek to go higher with him. See, that can be corrected right now for anybody who's ever slipped in Christ. Right now is your time to say, nope, I want to restart. See, with the Lord, you can have a restart. You guys hear me? With the Lord, you can have a restart. And this is your time. This is your time. Not to get locked in everything else, right? But to say, nope, Lord, and make him no promises. Don't make any promises. Oh, I'm going to follow you this time all the way. Don't do that. Stop doing that. Don't make any promises. But simply say in your heart, right? Lord, I desire to follow you as best I can. You know my limitations. You know my issues. You know my problems. You know my everything. I desire to follow you as best I can. Make no promises. Don't make any promises. Because if you make a promise, 
you're already going to have a chain attached to you, right? You're not keeping a standard for people. This is not some public standard. This is real. And so in your heart of hearts, simply convey to the Lord that, that you open yourself up to him. He knows exactly where you are. You want to follow him to the best of your ability. Will he help you do that? Did you know that the Lord will help you follow him? Did you know that? Help you follow him. So remember that. Make no promises that you're held by no standard of anybody else. But follow Christ as best you can. And let him know, hey, I've got hang-ups. Lord, you know me. I've got hang-ups. But I want to follow you as best I can. As best I can. And then you take each day. And you endeavor to do that. If you fall, get back up again. If you fall again, get back up again. If you fall again, get back up again. And follow the Lord to the best of your ability. Learn to start living without bondage. Get yourselves from out from under. You know, Christ does not want you heavy laden, does he? All you guys who are weighed down with so much. He doesn't want you that way. He wants you released and free. Free. See how easy it is if you don't discuss this. If we do not discuss this, it is so easy to have your life under weights, under this strain of standards and everything else. Ah, leave it alone. Throw it away. Give it to the Lord. You know how you give something like that to the Lord? You stop trying to make everything happen, and you realize the truth. You know what the truth is? You're being kept, and without the Lord, you can't make anything happen. You know what the truth is? You've messed up more than you've helped. And the Lord's highly aware of it. Be thankful for what he has intervened with. Have an understanding that without the Lord's intervention, all of your stuff would be messed up. It would, no matter how hard we try. There's always some unknown element that pops in and messes everything up. So start where you are. Start where you are in freedom. Right? Give up that burden to the Lord. All these things you're trying to do, this, that, and the other. All right? Give that up to the Lord and start walking in freedom. Stop putting yourselves on a deadline and start walking in freedom. Start walking in freedom. Walk in freedom. Say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Just as I am, here I am. And you go forward. You go forward where you are. That's your brand new starting point. See, that's the beauty of Christ. So long as that sacrifice stands, you have a restart this day. Have it in your heart to do it wholeheartedly. Make no promises. Don't make not, not one promise. Make no promises. Make none. None. Don't make promises with people either. Don't do that either. Make no promises. Keep chains away from you. Start living free so that you can enjoy, right? Those simple things are the most high. So that you can be a partaker of the goodness of the Lord without all these heavy weights on you. You know how sometimes you see people enjoy themselves in the Lord and you're sitting over there? Oh, why can't I do that? Because you're thinking about everything you messed up. You're thinking about how you can't get to a certain level. Right? And in so doing, you don't even realize this. You're defying the Lord in your own thoughts. And so you never reach that point. Freedom. Time for God's children to be free. Yes, we have a beast coming. Yes, we have a set of kingdoms in the earth that look like they're, they're just normal, but they're dark. Yes, we have messed up policies in all lands, and yes, we're close to a global war. Yes, the weather is going to take a lot of people, right? So what? These things were always going to come. What does that have to do with your salvation? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Leave all those things in the Lord's hands. Become an observer and a student of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Become that. Be free. Be free. So that you can smile again for real. Mm -hmm. Be free. Be free. See, that's where healing comes in. Why would God give a healing to a grumpy person who is constantly complaining and grumpy about everything? Why would you restore a person who's like that? I wouldn't restore a person like that. You couldn't give a good thing to them because it would only be good for a second and then they would find something to complain about. Time for change. Time to be free. It is, don't you think? Hmm? So that you too can be a partaker of the goodness of the Lord. Because whether you know it or not, the goodness of the Lord never stopped. It's just that people stopped receiving it. 
Every time people start to partake of the world, they get laden in this heaviness of the world and the decisions of the world and everybody else's decisions. They can't do anything. Right? right now, some of you guys, you have a headache. You have a headache because of politics. You have a headache because of Joe Biden. You have a headache because of Trump. You have a headache because of Benjamin Netanyahu. Right? That's their business. You pray for them, but you live your life. God gave you your life. He didn't give you their life. He didn't do that. He gave you your life. Didn't he? Huh? Who's a captain of your salvation? In other words, who's in charge? Who's leading your salvation? Hmm? Sound familiar? The captain of your salvation? Who's the king of your salvation? You? Biden? Trump? Congress? Who? Hmm? Let that stuff go. They're going to continue to live, and they're going to continue to make decisions based upon whatever it is they operate by. You pray for them and understand that God gave you your life. Your life. You get your life right? back in order with the Lord by simply taking away all promises, right? All those sworn declarations, everything else, let that stuff go. Start to live within the liberty of Christ. Leave those heavy chains to the one who's going to be chained with them. You're not to have chains on you. All of us are prodigal sons, by the way. All of us messed up. You know that, right? We have come back to the Lord multiple times. All of us have. And every single time, he embraces us. Somebody may ask, well, how do you know? How do you know if God hasn't given up on you? Because you would be dead. How about that? You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have breath. You wouldn't believe in Christ. You would not. Is there anybody here who does not believe in Jesus of Nazareth? Hmm? Because that person's in danger. Otherwise, you didn't put that belief within yourselves. God put that belief in you. So you would follow his son so that you would find his son. Your ability to hear scripture, certain ones, he gave that to you. He initiates all of that within you. He does that. That's how you know. Hmm? Some of us have gotten so complicated, though, we've trapped ourselves. We can't get out. Be free. Be free. And be yourselves. Be 100% yourselves. Don't try to be somebody else. Be yourself. God put you here, not some stranger that you invented, right? He put you here. Not that person you invented to survive in the world. He put you here. And he's coming back for the person he put here. He's not coming back for the character we made unto ourselves. Right? He's not coming back for the tough guy, Mike. Right? That battle-hardened numbskull. He's not coming back for that guy. He's coming back for the person he put here. For the child he put here. He will nurture the child he put here. He will not nurture what I invent. And that's something. He will nurture what he placed here. Right? God is thorough. He changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Be yourselves with the Most High. Listen and let everybody be themselves. I'm good at that. You know how people believe differently and it aggravates other folks? That doesn't aggravate me. You know why? Because Christ is raising us. So if somebody has some messed up view in something I think is messed up, who am I to say it's messed up? What if I'm wrong? You see, you have to have a prideful mind to say, oh, I'm not wrong, I'm right. I'm not saying that. I could be wrong, dead wrong, right? Remember that. Live in freedom and let others live in freedom. Do that. Let your families live in freedom. Have an understanding it's important that every single person make an individual choice. You cannot make their choice. You cannot do that. Right? That is deceitful, isn't it? It's deceitful if I make a choice for you. That is deceitful. Because it's not coming from your heart. Everybody will make a choice based on their heart. So you let those people make their decision. Respect who they are. 
right? Don't look at them for who they can be and say, well, I like who they can be. Stop doing that. Look at who is in front of you, right? And that's the one you pray for. Look at who's in front of you. That's the one you have compassion for. That's the one you talk to. And then experience the joy of change. There's nothing more joyful than to know a person for who they are, to love them where they are. And that's very important, to love a person where they are. Don't love a person for where they could be because you'll push them and then you'll push them right out of your lives. Parents, do not provoke your children to wrath. You know the Bible says that. A lot of parents, they want their children to be in a specific position because of what they went through. Listen to me, your kids have to make a choice. And to make their own choice. Encourage them to choose the Lord. Don't tell them to choose the Lord. Encourage them to lose, to choose the Lord. Because what hap you know what happens? Most of you, many of you, were driven away from your parents. Do you know why? Because they tried to choose for you, and it ran you off. You know it's the truth. So stop doing that to your children. How about that? Don't do that to your kids. Don't make a choice for them. Begin to compliment what they desire to do. Encourage them to do the right thing. Understand, they too are individuals. They're important. They are. Let them make their decisions. Right? Be there for guidance. God has given you an awesome responsibility for a season. Just for a season. But don't run them off. Some kids never go back to see their parents because they can't even talk to their parents. Their parents will always tell them what they think is right. They'll never accept who that child is. How many of you were like that? How many of you, nobody accepted you for who you were, and so you had to become somebody else simply to be accepted? Let's not living life, is it? Hmm? Think about that. How many of you had to become somebody else just to talk to your parents? How many of you had to become somebody else just to talk to the person you're with? That's not life. That's not what that is. What kind of stuff is that? No. Let your children be who they are. Give them good guidance. But tell them, you know, well, it, it, you got to choose Christ. Don't, don't do that. Offer Christ, right? Show them what Christ is in your own life. How about that? Demonstrate his forgiveness, his good. You want your children to know something about the Lord? Become all those attributes. You want them to learn. Instead of telling them God forgives, show them what forgiveness is. Instead of telling them that Jesus loves them, right? Show them what that love is. How about that? You can't be mad at your child not forgiving them and then you tell them Jesus forgives. No. You're a representative, an ambassador. That's what you are. You become that individual that will demonstrate those attributes of Christ to your children. Demonstrate. All too often, people may not hear you speak, but they will see what you do, and they'll see how you react. Haven't you noticed that? That somebody always has something to say about somebody else. Why? Because they're always watching. So let them watch. Let them watch how you forgive. Let them watch how you show compassion to those who will not show compassion to you. Let them see how you sacrifice things to give it to another and say nothing about it. Let them gain that understanding. Huh? You'll make a difference. And above all things, again, be free. Be free, be free, be free. You're free. See, when we talk about revelation, things falling apart in the world, they have to fall apart because the Lord decreed them to fall apart. That has nothing to do with you. Right? Get Hollywood out of your mind. Don't let Hollywood uh, uh, predetermine some outlook you're going to have in your head. Don't do that. Don't do that. In the Bible it says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty is freedom. Where the spirit is. 
You know what that means if you were to ever be free, right? Take those chains that you have put on yourselves and take those things off and say, Lord, here they are. I don't want them. They're gone, right? Let people know who you... Listen, one thing I messed up in life with when I was young was I would try to project a strength when I didn't have to. Do you know that? And it was so funny how people saw through it, right? You can be a gentle giant, yes, but you you don't have to project strength. Just simply be who you are, right? Sometimes you try to project that you're unbreakable. You're full of strength. You're full of resolve. You're full of this and full of that. You do that so much, other people catch on to that. And you become disingenuous to yourselves. Before you know it, you're in bondage because you have to keep up appearances, right? Don't do that. If you are flawed deeply, then say, hey, my name is so-and-so, and, -so and uh, these are my flaws. Take it or leave it. Because, listen, if a person likes you for what you're presenting, and that presentation is a falsehood, now you're nervous that if a person should truly know who you are, they won't like you. How many people out there have that saying in their head, well, you know, um, I can't do this, because if they knew that I was silly, in this area, they wouldn't like me. If they knew that I really didn't care about this area of life, they wouldn't like me. If they could see the real me, they wouldn't like me. Or you may be frightened of that if they can't see the real you. Right? They may not like you. Listen to me. Anybody who likes you, anybody who befriends you, right? if they really befriend you, they're going to really befriend you. And it's not going to matter what quirks you have, what you're good at, what you're not good at. You will matter. Not what you can offer and what you can't offer. Hmm? How many of you had friends in your life that are no longer friends? And you found out you wasted time trying to gain a friendship that would never be. I'm going to tell you something. You have friends out there. And do you know what? You'll never lose your friendships. Here's the issue, though. Some of the people you've met in your life were never your friends. Never. See, because the old adage is true. You can never lose what belongs to you. Never. If it belongs to you, you cannot lose it. If it's a friendship, you cannot lose it. Right? If anything belongs to you, it's yours. You cannot lose it. But, hear me on this, if something does not belong to you, you can do everything in your power to hold on to it. As soon as you shut one eyeball, it's gone. As soon as you turn your head, it's gone. If it does not belong to you, you're not going to keep it no matter what you do. Many of you are fighting to keep something that's not yours. You know what my advice is? Take both your hands, open them up, palm up, straight up in the air, and anything that belongs to you, then so be it. And if, if, if it doesn't, then so be it. Let everything around you also be free. Then you'll start to experience what freedom is. No one can ever say, well, I'm free myself, but, uh, but you know, I keep everything else chained up. That's not freedom. It's not freedom. When you're free, let everything else go free. Everything. Somebody walks away, they walk away. I can assure you, your real friends are coming. Right? So let me give you a principle real quick. You can also research uh, this in the Bible. Right? Here's a principle. I'm going to give you this principle. If you have something in your life that's not yours, right? Do you know it takes the place of what really belongs to you? And you'll never have what really belongs to you. Do you know that? If you have a replacement in your life, that thing that really belongs to you will never walk into your life. But as soon as you get rid, as soon as whatever does not belong to you, when it walks away, what truly belongs to you will walk into your life. Some of you found that out over time. You just didn't put that together. Some of you found that out with relationships. You let everybody go free. And then the person that truly adored you walked into your life. And they accept you for who you are, quirks and all, flaws and all, everything, right? There's no burden when something belongs to you. No burden is with it. 
You know that. No, but there's no burden. No burden of standards. No burden of anything. When you're trying to hold on to something that may not belong to you, right? Then what really belongs to you cannot come into your life. Not until that area is free. So a lot of us have things that do not belong to us. We do. And then we wonder, well, where's the richness in my life that the Bible talks about? Where's it at? Well, you can't have it because you're trying. You, you've got some. You're, you, you've got hold of something that does not belong to you. And what really belongs to you, well, it can't come. Imagine yourself, right? You have an envelope. That envelope is crusty. But it's the very color you've always wanted, but it's crusty. And so you hold on to it. Now, while you're holding on to this envelope, you're going to walk through your life never needing that envelope, right? You, you don't need an envelope. You already have one. It's crusty, but it's the color you like. So you already have one, right? So you never look for an envelope. You never consider any envelopes because you've got a crusty one in your pocket. Right? Now, it doesn't look too good, but it's the color you want. And so you keep it. Here's what happens now. When you look at that envelope and you come to your senses and you say, wait a minute. This envelope, it is the color, but it's crusty. Right? So, well, you know, I'm going to leave this on this table. And if I come back and if that thing is still there, right? Then that is the envelope. So you go away and you come back and it disintegrated. It's gone. It just fell apart as soon as you let it go. So next day you go out, all of a sudden, you start noticing envelopes everywhere. And then you see the one that truly draws you, right? And it's the envelope you've always wanted, and it's clean, not crusty. And guess what? You go up to get it, and somebody says, well, you know, you can have this. I know, I know it's the price on everything, but you can have this one, Right? Because when something belongs to you, there's always a supernatural event around it. You don't pay a price for it. That's not what happens. Now that you're receptive to it, it can come. You see that? You're receptive to it. So long as you have the imposter in your life, you're not receptive to anything else. When that imposter is gone, you're receptive. And then what truly belongs to you, you'll have. Now your life is complete. You have your favorite envelope. And it's clean, not crusty. And it won't disintegrate. If you put it down and come back a year later, it's going to be the same way. If you live, leave 10 years and come back, it's the same way. Why? It's your envelope. See, when something does not belong to you, if you put it down and walk away, it will disintegrate. It'll fall apart. So a lot of you find yourselves, most of your life is devoted to what? Maintenance. To keep things in your life, you're doing maintenance. That's no way to live life. To live half your life doing maintenance on everything to keep it in your life. Are you kidding? When something belongs to you, it'll never leave you. Do you know that? It'll never leave you. If it leaves, it wasn't yours. Because what really belongs to you will never leave you. Hmm? Do you see what people have done? See, the world will tell you, go get what you want. And God is saying, I've already got something for you. Just be receptive to it. That's what your father's saying. Your father's not going to tell you, I'm going to give you a, a, a orange envelope. But then some imposter comes, well, this is an orange envelope, but it has 92 holes in it. Well, that's not, that's not mine. Mine has no holes. When you hold on to the replacement, you're not receptive to what truly belongs to you, and it cannot come. Have you noticed with the Lord, nothing comes until you're empty? How many have noticed that? Until you're empty, and it's a biblical principle in the Bible, until you're empty, nothing comes. So long as you're full, nothing is coming. You remember Jesus said you cannot put new wine in old wineskins. Can't do it. Okay. You have to put the new wine in new wine skin. Many of you have people in your life you're trying to manage the friendship. You can't live without that friendship. So you recognize a part of what truly belongs to you, right? But it's incomplete. That's how 
That's how darkness can get you. It'll give you half of what you want. God doesn't do that. What truly belongs to you is fulfilling to you. Period. It is fulfilling. How easy of a principle is that? Hmm? That's a very easy principle. There we are with that. Live free. Live free, everybody. Because the Lord knows we're going through, we're about to go through a series of days, right? That the average person is going to be stressed out. But what I'm telling you is this. In this time where everything is being shuffled, do you not know that's when what truly belongs to you is going to find you because it too will be shuffled. You may not know this. What belongs to you is looking just for you and it may have an imposter. You're looking for something. It's looking for something too. Friendships, your true family that the Lord has given you, right? Your confidants, everything. God desires you to be in completion. This is not your paradise, but he has put things into your life that will assist you in your walk in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He did not put us here alone. We make ourselves alone. We do that. We do that often, don't we? Well, time to have that corrected. Time to not live that way anymore, so tell Satan his plan did not work yet again. It has fallen apart. Your declaration... Right? Of being free is how it begins. You guys got that? Your declaration of being free. Free in who you are. Not throwing up some facade of who you want to be. Be yourselves 100% flaws and all. Flaws and all. You know what the Bible says? Confess your faults one to another. A fault is when Mike from around the world cannot perceive a screen door. And so I walk through it. That's what a fault is. Right? It did not say confess your sins one to another. Did you notice that a lot of people get that mixed up? They said, well, the Bible says confess your sins one to another. No, it does not. You confess your sins to the Most High. You confess your sins to Jesus of Nazareth. You confess your faults one to another. Let another person know what you're not good at. And don't be ashamed of that. Let them know what you're not good at. See, here I am, take it or leave it. But this is me. Listen, when you make a friend, when you, when you meet people in your life, and they know what you're no good at, you're talking about absolute freedom then, right? You're talking about an openness that you never saw coming. A relationship without a burden. Without a burden, right? That's when beautiful times start. And in the worst of times, when you have the worst of times around you, but you're with those you have a bond with. There is no more precious time you can ever endure. Do you not know that the worst times, the worst times in your life, surrounding the worst conditions in your life, can be the most bonding times in your life. It can be the best moments you have ever had. Hmm? The best you've ever had. So you military people, you know that. The reason why a military person is closer than your brothers, sisters, parents, and everybody else is why? Because you were in trouble with him. Listen to me. You were in trouble with him. You know how you get in trouble and the first thing you want to do is withdraw? No. When you're really in trouble, then your true friends will be right there. They will share in your trouble with you, right? They'll still be your friends. They'll still be quirky and kooky and all those other attributes, whatever that is. You'll be who you are, and you'll be delivered, right? When you're in trouble together and you survive it, a bond is formed, a bond that many of you are missing. You're missing that bond. Once a person has that bond, do you know that aggression is gone? It's gone. It's like it does not exist. Your anger fits won't happen again. That's a fact. Anger fits normally happen through a starvation of love itself. That means you have a lack of people who are thorough around you, who are truly friends of yours around you. 
Oh, and yes, in the Bible it says a friend is closer than a brother. That's the truth. Okay? Why? Because a brother will evaluate. A friend will not. A true friend is not going to evaluate you. So, ladies, stop watching Lifetime. That's not the way the world works. Now, if you're a serial killer or something like that, that probably is. Awesome. It is. Today is your day. It's up to you to take it. It's up to you to take this day and to begin to live in this day. That's up to you. Didn't the Lord say he had come that we may have life and have life more abundantly? I can assure you that many people know what it is not to have an abundant life. Most people thought that was money or substance or something like that. No, an abundant life is a full life. Money is like a speck of sand on a beach full of other specks of sand. Money is only one speck of what you need in this life. I want to speak. When I, you know, when everybody stops trying to be a spiritual Rambo, we're going to be good to go. That's why it's important that you be exactly who you are. Okay, we're going to take a break. When I come back, we're going to go right to the book of Revelation. Is that all right with you guys? Is that good with you guys? I'm going to go right into the book of Revelation. Now, you listen, if you guys have questions... And I don't answer your questions because I did not see them. Or I just won't answer that at that moment. You guys know I'm quirky. I'll be right back in a few minutes right here at COT. We're going to begin in the book of Revelation. I'll be right back. All right, you guys, let's go. Revelation, shall we? You, you know what? No one, not one person that I saw, um, they didn't ask a very specific question in uh, Revelation. And it was about, it was, it was, uh, Revelation 20. No one said, why would God bind Satan a thousand years and then let him loose again? Why would he do that? No one asked that question. Could, could anybody come up with, uh, come up with a question like that? Nobody asked that question. I wondered that question. I said, why in the world would the Lord bind all darkness? Right? Because essentially, it, it, two things you learn here, right? Satan himself is darkness. He is the negativity in your mind. He is anger. He is wrath. And right? it's all those negative things that disrupts peace. When he's bound a thousand years, there's peace. There's peace. Why would he then lose him? Revelation 20. Well, that be an important uh, thing there to go over, right? Now, we can only speculate. But why would he do that? Why? Mm. You know what? Right now, when a person is not seeking holiness, why an atheist, for example, why would an atheist, right, an atheist, call themselves an atheist? An atheist is someone who specifically has no belief in God, right? Yet an atheist will turn around and say, well, you know, I believe that something created mankind. I just don't believe it is, you know, the God of the Christians. That's what they end up saying. And they always have a story. An atheist does. They'll say, well, why did God let my daughter die when she was young? Well, why did God let my spouse die in a car accident? That's an atheist. An atheist, most of them have been hurt deeply. They yeah, have, right? And so when something bad happens, they'll say, I just don't see how a loving God would allow such things, right? I knew an atheist who was an atheist because of dogs. 
They said, why would a loving God allow dogs to suffer under the hands of such responsible people? The hard ones, right? Then this other person said, why would a loving God allow a child to be aborted? Why? I know an atheist like that. He was married. They had an abortion. And he hated his wife from that day forward. Atheists. So atheists have been hurt big time. They spend a lot of their time disproving the Christian Bible. Have you noticed? Right. So it's almost like an antichrist movement. But those people are hurt. They're very hurt. Those people always say, you have those people. Then you have another group of people who say, well, you know, I would believe, but I'd have to see something first. Isn't that, isn't that what they say? Right. Some of you are no doubt out there right now. If you were to behold a supernatural event, your faith level would go off the, off the meter for a little while anyway. Right. Don't worry, we're going to analyze this too. We have a loving father. We have a father who knows this. He knows this. Right? He knows. And a thousand years, he rules and he reigns with those who are faithful to him. And in the Bible, we can extract that people learn the true feast of tabernacles. From year to year, they do things from year to year for a thousand years of peace. The ways of holiness are instilled in the earth. And they're flesh and blood human beings. They're the supernatural ones, which are you, those who are translated, because you're faithful now. But there's still going to be regular people on the earth. Satan is bound, no negative influence, so nobody's going to have a mind to go and sin or do any of those things. Right? They get to see angels. They get to see Christ. They get to see how all of holiness works. They get to see it. See, we do everything by faith. We do not get to see it. They get to see it, right? And when they see this, the Lord says, when Satan is loosed, he's going to go out and deceive the nations of the world again. So, Satan goes out to deceive the nations of the world again. Satan's deceit works by way of flesh, doesn't it? He'll deceive. He's going to gather them together for that great battle, right? To go against God himself. In those days, men will be convinced they need to destroy God and his works, and they will. From the, but they will gather themselves together, the four corners of the earth. The number of whom the Bible says is as the sand of the sea. Can you imagine everybody who's a human being on earth? All of a sudden, Satan is loose and they get this idea. There's an entity here trying to make you bow to it or some weird thing like that, right? But prior to him being loosed, they didn't have that thought, did they? Satan could not deceive them. He did not deceive them in any way. We can glean something from this. There are people right now, there are people right now, their excuse is, well, I haven't seen enough to follow, you know, the living God or Christ or anybody else. In those days, they're going to see it, and they're still going to follow Satan. Do you hear me? They're going to see it. They're going to behold it. They're not going to walk like us. They're going to actually live with it. They're going to be born into a world where they actually see angels, supernatural beings, Christ Jesus. They're going to see it, and they're still going to fall as soon as Satan is loosed again. But right now, you have a lot of people right now, what are they saying? What are they saying? Well, if I just could see something, you know, something extra, yeah, I would go ahead and, you know, go all the way. See, we're called by faith. So it's an intuitive knowing that we have, that seed of faith, right, that measure of faith. 
that we operate by. That's why we believe, because God put that belief in us. That was the measure of our faith, or a portion of the measure of our faith. It initiates it. And so we follow Christ, because we have this internal knowing. We don't need proof. We're doing everything we do by faith. That's why God is not showing everything right now. That's precisely why. Because if he did show something, we would no longer follow him by faith. But because the word says we follow him by faith, we know that's a seal he's not going to show too much. Right? So then all those who were true to following the Lord Jesus without proof, then they followed him based on that internal confirmation of which Satan can never corrupt. That means those who follow Christ by faith will never fall away in the future, ever. That's what it means. If you follow him now, being given no proof, but you follow him now, and you do so faithfully, right? then when you see the proof, you will never fall away from him. Your loyalty will be real and true. Right? If we were to follow the Lord because of what we saw, here's the problem. Whenever, whenever, you surrender to a condition where you befriend someone, you hang around someone because they did the one thing good, they're going to have to continue doing good things in order for you to follow them. See how that works? Once you, once you do the one thing, you're going to have to continue doing more things or people will fall away. Period. Right? They're going to fall away. <laughs> now, these other folks, these other folks who end up being condemned... The other folks, first of all, they end up being condemned. Those who are alive during the thousand-year reign, they will be hurt of the second death. We cover that in 20 and 21, the second death. Remember that? Blessed and holy is he that hath part the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Right? Those are the, and who are these people? Who are these people? The one, those are the ones, right? Those are the ones who got, who got the victory over the beast. Those are the ones who were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Those are the ones right, who did not take the mark. They did not worship the beast, nor his image, right? They didn't have his mark in the foreheads or in their hands. They're the ones that will live and reign with Christ a thousand years. They are, right? They will. Somebody says, if we are translated, reigning with Christ a thousand years, who are the rest of the people? The 144,000 are the virgins. They become one with the Messiah. Uh-huh. See, I like that question. Now we're going to perceive that. I, I love that one. The 144,000 are not ruling and reigning with Christ. They're not. 144,000 are the virgins who come from the 12 tribes. And they are specifically sent back for the purpose of the Messiah. Hmm? But what about those who got beheaded, who lived in the time of the beast, who were essentially overcome and they maintained their faith? Those are the ones that will rule and reign with Christ. Those who are found in the book of life. I know a lot of people like the 144,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the rest of the people be one and the same, but they're not. Because, see, Jesus specifically grafted us into the branch. Those who are outside of the 12 tribes, those who are outside of the 12 tribes were grafted into the branch. If you say the 144,000 are the same as those who rule and reign with Christ, then it undoes the grafting in of those who were outside the whole family, were grafted into the branch. And if you're grafted into the branch, you are not part of the original. You were made part of the original through the grafting. See how that works. Thank you, Lord. It's that easy. It's that simple. Hmm? It's that simple. But the 144,000 are not corrupted by woman. These are virgins. Right now in Israel, they keep the 144,000. They've been doing that for years. Well, not for many years, but for years. 
They know they have to do that. They were told they had to do that. That's why it was important to get all those nations back together again. They were told to do that. So they have institutions of people, kids, that are kept in the ways of the Lord. Mm -hmm. They already know about that. See, the problem is, you got a lot of us in Western society, we don't know what they're doing over there. We don't know that, right? We do know we're grafted into the branch. We do know that we're in the heart of the kingdom of the beast. And, and it, I don't know about you, but I know, I, I, I don't even, I don't worship the dragon now. Those who will not worship the beast also do not worship the dragon now. There's a lot of dragon worship that goes on now. You know what that is? World worship. If you worship the world, if you uphold the world, you're upholding the dragon. Oh, we're going to get that established tonight. When you uphold the world, you're upholding the dragon. There's lots of people who worship the dragon right now. They praise the dragon right now. Now, does anybody just pop out and say, you know, we're praising you, dragon, worship, uh, or Lucifer? No, that's not what they're doing. What they are doing is upholding what the dragon is responsible for. And what is he responsible for? The kingdoms of this earth. Didn't we read the book of Daniel? Those who worship the kingdoms of this earth are in worship of the dragon. If you worship what the dragon does, you worship the source. You're worshiping the dragon. Let's go ahead and get to the heart of the matter. People will kill for the sake of what the dragon has done. Yeah, they worship the dragon. Hmm? They worship it. I do not. Some of us see the filth of this world. I see it. Not everybody does, but I do. It's okay if you don't see all of the filth of this world. I see it. I can't stand it. But I've been like that since I was a little kid. Some of you who were born with unfortunate circumstances, you better thank your God. Because just think, if you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth, you would like the world. And it'd be hard to break you away from the world. Many of you were not born with a silver spoon in your mouth. And you see the true nature of the world, don't you? You see what it does. Hmm? Politics is a recruitment tool for things you would understand right now, probably. Politics seems so harmless. I tell you right now, it is a major tool of the dragon himself. When all of God's children find that out, they're going to throw up in their mouths. I keep trying to tell people that. All it takes is for a person to see what they dedicate. And then you'd understand. The Lord's going to break that. He's going to show it for what it is. And all who are partakers of it are going to regret the day they were. They'll see the truth of it. They'll run away from it. They will. But it's part of the draconian system. What man has built in the earth is nothing less than what Satan has influenced them to build. Somebody says, uh, Mike, can you clear this up? I went to church service and it was said that we have it wrong. We are not the bride of Christ like I've always been taught. Well, that's why people should read the word for themselves. I'm a bit different than everybody else. I believe what the Bible wrote. I do not believe what man says. What does the Bible say the bride of Christ is? What does the Bible say it is? The Bible says the bride of Christ is the new Jerusalem. 
That's what it says. It's coming down out of heaven. The untainted Jerusalem. But wait a minute. The new Jerusalem is just a, is just a building without the people. Is it coming down empty? No, it is not. The new Jerusalem is coming down occupied by those who are of the new Jerusalem. My goodness. Why do people get stuck on that so much? While everybody else can call themselves the bride, right? Listen, you, you guys get stuck on those details. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm one of those Christ died for. I'm the redeemed of the Lord. The new Jerusalem. The bride of Christ is untainted. And that's how it's going to remain. And all those who partake of that are the ones who were written in the book of life. Christ will determine his own bride. Man has no right to do that. As, as people keep messing up. Jesus will choose his own woman. How about that? The world is not going to choose who Christ's bride is. Jesus knows who his bride is, and that bride is complete. She's not incomplete. So if it's just a building, that's, that's incomplete. No, it's going to be a city occupied. The saints of the Lord. It's right there in the Bible. Here's the issue, though. There have been lots of things people have said over time that are not found in the Word of God, period. There are lots of sayings and lots of things that people have heard over time that have no basis in the truth, sometimes, unfortunately. Right? But they still convey something. Correct? Somebody says, then, who was invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb? Jesus told us that. He already told us that. Did he not bid the guests to come from all over the place, go into the highways and byways and go get anybody you can because the people that were supposed to go there at first rejected the offer? Isn't that what he said? Oh, see, now they see that's the, that's the root. That's part of the roots of the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Don't feel bad either because all too often people get into the details of things and they miss the entire foundation. That's why I like the foundation of the gospel. That's why the foundation is so incredibly important. There have been people here at COT who have learned things that, frankly, nobody was speaking of. And then when I spoke of them, I got cursed out. I did. Yeah, I did cursed out. Just I got cursed out. There's several things that we spoke of here I got cursed out for, for speaking them. But I have to go with what the word says. I can't go with these popular sayings of people. No. And I've noticed something. When people start talking, they get away from the word and they go right back to these popular sayings. I never agreed with those popular sayings because I've always wanted the truth. I'm not one of those who's going to build a bridge between the gospel and the world. I'm going to tell you something. I can't stand the world. That's a, I never liked the world. Since I was small, I felt like a prisoner in this place. I go to hurry up and leave this place. If the Lord called me home right now, I'd say, I'd give everybody a salute and go. I don't love this world. I, I don't love the things in it. I don't like what man has done. And to put the icing on the cake, the Lord showed me what's behind the curtain. In my career, I was invited the things. They thought they were going to recruit me into certain aspects, into certain disciplines, and it didn't know I can do that. But they showed me. So now that I've seen a, a big truth out there, right, I'm certainly not going to fall for it. And I do my best to by way of the word of God to uncover that thing to other folks so they can see it too. There are too many people in love with the world. They truly do believe in the world. They think it's harmless. No, it's a big ritual. And everybody who partakes of the world becomes part of that ritual, period. Why do you think the anger comes? That doesn't come from your Father in heaven. 
as coming from a dark source? Who do you think thoughts of infidelity, rage, and all these things come from? It's coming from the world. When that's broken, those things never come back. Rage does not come to you. Anger does not come to you. You know what people do? They justify it because they try to uphold the world and the things of this world. I'm never going to do that. Have you noticed? I'm not doing that. I'm hated for that. I hope you guys understand that. I am hated because I do not uphold what man has built in this earth. Because what they have built, they built outside of our Father. If they built it based on the Father, the Father would be part of it right now, but he's not. If it were holy, Jesus would be the name above it. But it's not. It's all falling apart. Hmm? And people don't know they can't make heads or tails of what is real. And that there are people that you love, that you like, that you respect. But listen to me. That same loyalty you have to people, put all of that in Christ. Sometimes you can be so loyal to a person that if they continue to speak these worldly lines, you'll believe exactly what they say out of your respect for them. Don't do that. Free humanity of your trust and put all your trust in the Most High. Set everybody free. Put your expectations in that which cannot fail. That is Christ. So that you can intervene for those who truly have gone astray. Do that. Man does not have the truth. Our Father has the truth. Hmm? Lord has the truth. On those foundational things, it is always good to cover those things. Always good to cover those things. Someone says, uh, Mike, do you know what image a statue in... Let me see. Let me go back. Somebody asked the government... What image or statue in Daniel 231? I imagine as a dragon, but modern Christian iconography represents it. Man's figure, figure thoughts. Listen, th th look, I want you guys to analyze something. Take no offense to what I'm about to say, right? I want you guys to analyze something. Listen to the question. Mike, do you know what the image statue is in Daniel 231? The person says, I imagine it, uh, it as a dragon, right? Like Revelation 12, but modern Christians, iconography, Christian iconography represents it as a man's figure. It represents it as a man's figure. Both these perspectives come from thought. The truth comes from the Most High. If you want to take the limitation of the supernatural nature of the Most High. It's time we start to seek Him for what is real and what is not. If your truth is divined from mankind, you can only go as far as mankind. If your truth comes from the Most High, it's going to supersede everything you ever thought possible. It will. And right now we need our truth from the Most High, which is confirmed by the Holy Spirit. God doesn't give the truth to one person. He gives it to all. That means all of us have the truth. And when that truth is spoken, that's when all of us say amen. But those two perspectives, if you were to leave it as it's written, which is what I do, right? If we were to go to Daniel... 231 and look at what they what's being shown there right? that great image and then we look and see what that great image was we start to see god has used that image to represent the kingdoms of this world in a consistency 
That is mind-blowing. That King Nebuchadnezzar is that head of gold. Right? So clearly, the visual is just the simple statue. But the statue and its components represent something like the head. Right? Like the midway area, like the chest. These are different grades of kingdoms. That's why King Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. He is the standard of that kingdom, and everything else is going to be inferior to that. It's quite simple, actually. Very simple. Then when we get down to the feet and the toes, that represents the last kingdom on this earth, before the everlasting kingdom. Partly weak, partly strong. Is feet part iron, part clay? We start to see that. Right? His breast was silver, his belly was brass, his legs iron, his feet iron and clay. And that is very consistent with what Baruch said, with what Jeremiah said, Isaiah, Ezekiel, that as time goes on, man becomes weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. The, the knowledge increases but they themselves become weaker. Same thing with this statue. Same thing. And the last kingdom prior to the everlasting kingdom, where all the materials were of a weak material, right? And, and the lower part's inferior to all of it. It constitutes the last kingdom on the earth. There are only four kingdoms that were going to be on the earth. Those four kingdoms represent what? Four eras of mankind. Four eras of mankind. King Nebuchadnezzar was of one era, right? And then we have the, the, the uh, uh, breast and his arms of silver. That's another era. Then we have the belly and his thighs of brass. That's another era. Then we have his legs of iron. That's another era. Then we get to the last era. His feet were part iron, part clay. And then the interpretation of this statue pops up. Right? And how do we know these are the four eras on the earth? Because in Daniel 2.38, didn't it say, Whosoever the children, or wheresoever the children of men dwell, and the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven are, he has given them into thine hand, King Nebuchadnezzar, to rule over them. And men have kept these kingdoms all this time to rule over the earth. Listen, through the kingdoms of the world, men rule the earth. Don't you know that? that that's, that's very consistent. And that's what's happening here. God gave you dominion over the earth. But through the kingdoms of this world, these other type men rule the earth. And God has indeed given them dominion over it which is why we are prone to these kingdoms and systems in this earth. See, it's quite clear. If you leave it as it is, if you can see it for how it is, the statue, I'd never debate over the statue. Of course the statue is in representation as God has given the interpretation, right? To get into an argument as to is it, is it, is it uh, this figurative thing or this? That's irrelevant. God has given us a representation of what's happening in the earth. It's up to us to utilize it. He's given us this that we may understand the earth. He didn't want us blind concerning what's happening in the earth. And all these kingdoms of the earth are bound by that statue. They are part of the standard. And they all have one thing in common. What was it? The rule of law, starting in Babylon. The rule of law began in Babylon. Isn't that what people worship right now, the rule of law? Do you know the declarations that state that the rule of law will remain? Humans will come and go, but the rule of law remains. And there are many who took an oath to uphold that rule of law, whether living or dead. There are those who enforce that rule of law above all sovereigns. See, these are actual oaths that people take. These are things that people commit themselves to. So in other words, the rule of law has life unto itself and it outlives humanity. 
People rise and fall, but the rule of law remains. Men have given birth to what? To something in the earth. Something that is so often missed. And it's already ruling over everything. It is the only thing that can, that can kill a king. And turn around and kill the rest. The rule of law. It is what men will enforce, won't they? The rule of law. Whatever it says, men will enforce. And people die by it every single day. In Now, if you think of the rule of law, and you look at today's world, and we know that corruption has entered into the rule of law, then it is not holy. It's not holy at all. And because it's not holy, because it's amendable, right? It's amendable, which means the, the rule of law states that you can commit adultery. The rule of law states you can steal in certain ways. The rule of law states you can covet your neighbor's wife. The rule, rule of law has a life of its own. And it has men rise and fall for it. They're bound by it. And men will enforce it. They will. It's not a human, right? So it's, it's a what? A beast? If it has life, but it's not categorized. It's a beast. Now, people right now, they get offended by that. Why? Because the rule of law is more like a god to a lot of people in this earth. It is. All declarations are made toward the rule of law. If everything else falls and falls away, the rule of law remains. It will remain. In the hands of an iniquitous people, the rule of law is death itself. It is oppression. It is a legal right to murder and to do all things evil. In the wrong hands. Listen to me carefully. Jesus is Lord of all. Not one document on the earth is ever going to be appointed over the Messiah in my life. It will not. People hate that. But that's the way it is. What's happening? Anyway, so there we are about that statue. Back to Revelation. So back in Revelation, a thousand-year reign, right? These people in the thousand-year reign, they, they see miraculous things and miracles and everything else. And yet, when Satan is freed again, they are deceived by Satan. And they go against the living God. And that's something. Deceived by Satan. After seeing all that, they're still deceived. It's almost like God said, okay, these people are saying that if they had that additional component, it would have changed everything in their lives. It's almost like God gave them that additional component. He gave them sight to see, and they still fell away. Right? They're still going to fall. But most of the people who said, well, why doesn't God show himself or why doesn't God show this? The same people who say that are the same people who are going to be living at the time of Yeshua HaMashiach, right? Beholding all these supernatural things, and they're still going to fall away when Satan is loosed. Why? Because the Lord gave us something very important. He said, the will of your father you're going to do. Whoever your father is, that's the will you're going to do in the earth. If you end up doing all iniquitous things and you hate righteousness, then the will of your father you're going to do, it identifies who your father is. Right? It does. It identifies who your father is. That's why he told those folks, Jesus told those folks in times of old, he said, your father is the devil because you seek to kill me. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he said, the will of your father you will do. 
That's what Jesus said. And it's true. Whoever your father truly is, you're going to end up doing his will in the earth. Period. Period. All of us. All of us will. Period. Again, that's very simple when you keep the Bible, the Bible. When you keep it as it is, you need not change anything in the Word of God. God gives us an interpreter, the Holy Spirit. He does. Yeah, a thousand years of peace, godly rule, and yet they still fall away. That's right, which means what? See, God said, at the end of the matter, no one's going to have an excuse. No one's going to say, well, I didn't know. No one's going to say, well, I, if I had just one more chance, I would. No, nobody's going to say that. Everyone will have made their final decision. It's going to show you guys the other origin. Somebody says, uh, okay, okay. Somebody says, so it's more like, uh, I'm just saying, no. Though not like a statue of blind justice, a, a, a statue that represents the errors of time for humanity. It gives us a picture of the kingdoms that will be in this earth. All those kingdoms constitute one statue. That's all. And the, of course, the everlasting kingdom comes in and subdues all those, uh, you know, things together. Somebody has a Revelation 2012. Somebody has a question about 2012. What's your question about uh, Revelation 2012? It says, Now I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to the works. What's your question? What's your uh, question? Right before Le Revelation 20, in this context, right? Jesus, or, or the, the um, it was spoken of, the second death was spoken of, right? Blessed and holy is he that hath part of the first resurrection, all such the second death hath no power. If the books are opened, right? If the, notice the books are open, and, but then another book is open, the book of life. If you're forgiven... You're in the book of life. If you're not forgiven, all your works are in those other books. Oh, oops. Well, how do we know this? Because the Lord cleared that up. You, you know how people say, listen to me, this, this is a big one. You know how people say that you're going to be accountable for every word that comes out of your mouth. And that truly is in the word of God, right? Why did Jesus say? That when you are washed by the blood of the Lamb and forgiven of your sins, the Father will throw your sins into the sea of forgetfulness and remember them no more. They're stricken from all things. Stricken from everything. You have an advocate with the Father. So all those in the book of life, there's no need to go over everything they did because of the blood. Do you see that? Do you all see that? When you're in those other books, you're in trouble. You are. If you're in the book of life, rejoice. Why? Because you've been forgiven for everything that would be in any of the other books. But God told us something specific. He said he would remember your sins no more. If he remembers your sins no more, if he casts them away, he's forbidden them to be recorded they're not recorded they're not and see if you look at that if you look at when it says that that every idle word that a person speaks you know is going to be be looked at and everything they do is going to be looked at not for the ones of whom jesus died for because that would undo the blood god will not remember your sin anymore when forgiven by jesus of nazareth so that when you repent, it is done. That's why Jesus said, don't, you know, don't rejoice because you can't command a demon. 
Rejoice because your names are written in the book of life. Anybody whose names are in the book of life are free indeed. Because the Son has set you free. You are totally exalted of everything. Man has no power to do that. Not one man on this earth has power to do that. Christ does that. Nobody else, no man, no woman can do that. Christ does that. When you're forgiven of something, it no longer exists. It is separated from you. See, that's why when you read the Old Testament, that's why the new wine and the old wine, wine they don't mix. When you go back to the Old Testament, you're thinking about deeds and works and this, that, and the other. But you're also forgetting about the blood of the Lamb. When you get back to the blood of the Lamb, having left the Old Testament again, you see the new covenant. That's what you start seeing. It's the same age-old argument they had a long time ago. It really is. A lot of people did not want that to be true. Why? Because if you could be judged of your deeds, then a priest could come by and judge your life. Right now, they, they can exercise power over you. They didn't want Christ in this world because why? Because when he came by, he took power away from the priests. He said, all of you have become priests. How about that? He said, no one can judge you, not those he washed. He did to tell his disciples, nobody can judge you. No, no, you're written in the book of life, back, not for those who belong to Christ. Even mentions it again in Revelation a few times. Same thing is mentioned again. It's a good foundational teaching, too. Hmm? Somebody says, uh-oh, I'm confused. We just read that in Revelation, uh, Revelation 20, when the books were opened. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books, plural, were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the works. The dead were judged. The dead. God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. Thank you. So there's the book of life, but there are other books. The book of deeds. Everything a person ever did is recorded. And if they're not washed in truth by the blood of the Lamb, they're going to be accountable for everything that proceeded out of their mouth and everything they did in the earth, and it will not be for them. It will be against them. those are the days when the sea gave up their dead those that are there in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works listen and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire so all those people who were judged because of their works were doomed but if you're found in the book of life you're free If your deeds are recorded, those deeds are not for you. Those deeds are against you. When God does something for you, it is to wipe away the record connected to you. Thank you, Jesus. So let, let, listen, listen. To have an understanding of this is to know that if you're written in the book of life, you're not in the other book. That's all been wiped away. That's why the two books were opened. All those, all those who were found in the other book, they didn't make it. Those who were found in the book of life did.
It's why we should be thankful that our names are written in the book of life, like Jesus commanded. Anyhow, that's pretty neat, right? Pretty neat. That's a foundational teaching too, right? Lots of people dispute that because there are, how many, how many is in there? I believe it's 163, 163 passages concerning that very thing. It reiterates over and over and over again how God has thrown away, right? All of what was against those who were washed by the blood of the Lamb. You truly have been separated from your sin. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. Those people who don't know this, they're the same ones that say, I wonder if I'm really going to heaven or not, because they really don't know. When you've been washed by the blood of the Lamb, your record, your record has been expunged. Of which the second death hath no power. Isn't that awesome? It has no power. That's the, that is the beauty of the book of life. The beauty of the book of life. Somebody says, uh, leave of the tree is for the healing of the nations. Yes. In the midst of the, it's, it's talking about Revelation 22. Showed me a picture of the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, right? But, the, but what is he describing? These are elements of what? These are elements of what? The nations, when the healing of the nations, when is that going to take place? See, the thousand year reign has to be talked about a little bit more. It, it does have to be talked about a little bit more. After the thousand year reign, final judgment takes place. There's no need for healing. Everything is separated. Everything is to be made new again, right? There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Prior to that time, there will be a thousand years of peace. There will be a massive demonstration here on this earth that will be just mind-blowing. And it will happen on the earth. And Satan will not be able to, to tamper with it. But even after all of what is established on the face of the earth and the beauty of it, after all that's established, anyway, how awesome is that? Yeah, we're going to have quite a well, you know what Isaiah talks about the thousand year reign. Ezekiel talks about the thousand year reign. Jeremiah spoke to the thousand year reign. So it gives you components of it. That's why, for example, the war of Gog and Magog, right? Why does it say in Revelation that Gog and Magog is fulfilled after the thousand year reign, not before? If you understood the declaration God had against Gog and Magog, you would see it. You would see it. You would see it. And it will be seen with absolute clarity as time goes forward. See, sometimes things are not quite seen right now. It does not mean they're not going to be seen in the future. If you belong to Christ, the truth will be revealed to you. You may not have, you may not have it right now, but you will have it. God will not leave any of us ignorant, right? Now that means he will give the truth to people but all too often, because of popularity, people will not state the truth. They state what people are used to hearing. I have foot and mouth disease. I'm not going to state anything you're used to hearing. That's why I live in the bushes. So I come out of the bushes, leaves all of my hair and stuff, right? Shirt tore up, and I'm speaking something. Everybody's looking at me crazy anyway. I might as well speak crazy. So I speak exactly what the Lord has given me. And over time, I've learned something. Over time, now it's not to say I'm right, the Lord is right, but over time, then folks begin to see it. It may be four years too premature, something like that, right? It may be two years premature, but I've learned that over time, people begin to see it, right? But God must, he uses certain people to break ground in things. 
And those are the people who take the grunt of the repercussions of those who try to control the narrative of the word of God. And yes, there are people in the earth who try to control how the word of God is interpreted. We've seen that countless times here in COT, where people come with this, we've heard it all, they speak the same way. They uphold the same stuff. The same old dead things they uphold, right? So it's almost like they keep people in bondage by doing this. I'm not sent here to perpetuate bondage. It's not what I'm here for. I don't believe anybody's here for that. Right? Those who did not accept Christ. Okay, okay, well, somebody had another question I'm looking for, I'm looking for, I'm looking for it, where's that? How many will be alive on earth after the Antichrist is revealed? Well, oh, well, listen, this is another one. Somebody just said something about the, somebody talked about the rapture getting eliminated. I believe the word of God. And what does the word of God say? That day everybody's looking for, right? That day everybody's looking for, that day will not come. Unless there come a falling away first and man of perdition be revealed. So that day is not going to come. Until the Antichrist comes. Uh-oh. That day shall not come, lest there come a falling away, and that man of perdition be revealed. Man of perdition is the Antichrist. That day is not going to come, lest there come a falling away, or, or falling away first, and that man of perdition be revealed. So that means the coming of the Antichrist must be here already, right? And, and many must fall away. Then those who are alive at that time, right? Because the trumpets can be blown at that time. They're going to be, there's going to be no last trump before the Antichrist gets here. He has to be here first. He's got to be here first. Those who are alive at the last trump, then they will experience that. But the last trump, is to be blown the one where all the mysteries of God should be fulfilled. That last trump follows a few trumps, doesn't it? Like the trump where all the green grass is burnt up. Those trumps where we have an incursion from the heavens here to earth, that is a physical happening. Then those who are alive. See, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, that day is going to come. Next week, no, it isn't, because the son of perdition has to be revealed. He's not revealed yet. When he is revealed, all of the body of Christ will know who he is, not one or two people. We're going to know who the Antichrist is, because the Antichrist is going to be revealed. So all of us will know who that is. So that day everybody's looking for is not going to come until... He comes. And he's not going to come unless he'll come up falling away first. That means people giving up on the faith. Well, that's starting to happen already, isn't it? That is your father's sequential order, and it will not be broken. It won't be broken. Everybody should have that one, right? That's, that's fairly simple. Listen, you're in good hands. But the book of life is key. Here's what I was going to tell you, though. You guys know about those three unclean spirits. Are you guys familiar with what DHS ran into? They're going to have somewhat of a reveal. I want you guys to pay attention to one of the hearings that's coming up. 
Why? Because it deals with some agents who were shaken. But not only agents, some townsfolk, and not only townsfolk, but some other people were also in it. We're not talking about aliens. We are talking about something that is described just like this. The top portion looked just like a frog. The bottom portion right, looked just like an upright walking man, and the low portion looked like a goat. And they smelled like burning sulfur. The smell was so bad, it burnt the eyes of those who were around it. They could smell the sulfur for weeks on end after if they'd gotten out of proximity. The reason why I want you guys to pay attention to this when they have the hearings on this is because you're going to begin to notice a manifestation time is taking place right now. It's not going to take place. It's taking place right now. We happen to be at a time in history where iniquity is high in the world, and not everybody is thinking about Christ. So certain areas that are devoid of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Well, if you take people who believe in the Lord Jesus out of a specific place, it's going to be overrun, and that's precisely what's starting to happen. Precisely. I want you guys to listen in these hearings about, they said, 98% of the UFOs that have been legitimately tracked have come out of the oceans, and they know that something is in the oceans. I want you guys to hear the parts where they said 76 bases in the oceans are known of, and they're not ours. We just can't get to them. How much you guys hear about that impenetrable barrier? The water within the water that nothing, not even a nail, could get through. Most importantly, those 119 people that were involved in it, I want you guys to listen to them. Because 119 people are not going to make up a story like that, where they would be suspended, Right? And all this kind of stuff to say, to tell people what they saw. These people are shaken to this very day. And they cannot help, they cannot help but to be drawn to the book of Revelation, each and every single one of them. One guy said, because they were supposed to go out and find them, right? He said, if you find anything, you're going to find something not from this world. And you'll regret the day you've, you've, you uh, located it. This is what they said. So it has severely disturbed some folks. We are in the days where some surprises are coming. You guys should be ready for that so you can still conduct yourselves in a decent way without being overwhelmed by the spirit of fear. Somebody said there's a video of Chuck Schumer arguing with someone that is sitting in a chair, but the video shows no physical body. There are lots of videos like that. And in fact, those videos are made at least three, four times a week. People have sat down to interview people that weren't there. People have invited people or, or take care of hospital patients that were not in the hospital. People have helped a person fill out an application and on security cameras, nobody is there, right? So cameras will not pick these things up. But you can see them with the human eye. This is happening all over the world. And it's happening every single day, just about in every single town. They really know this from people who shop for groceries. They, they have reviewed the footage, and, and too many times, all too often, at random, they can pick out a video, right? At random, they can pick it out. And somebody is interacting with something that's not there. And it's building, whatever it is, it's building. Of course, you guys should know what it is, but it's building. And it just so happens it goes hand in hand, hand in hand, with an absence of the foundation of Jesus in Christianity during this time. It goes hand in hand with the hostilities more and more people are beginning to exercise. Somebody says, Mike, have you seen any of these things? Well, I'll say it again. The KD Files speaks of hands-on things. 
I do not talk about subjects I don't have hands-on experience with. That would be highly irresponsible. See, I did that one time before. I did speak of something I did not have hands-on experience with. And it almost caused some people some irreversible harm. I'll never do that again. Never. Not ever. Do I think Betrayus is a reptilian? That didn't bother me one way or the other. Men are men, right? And uh, if something were a demonic entity, wouldn't it be lifted up by these systems? They're not going to kick it out. They're going to bow to it. They don't bow to Petraeus, do they? No, they don't. Is, is, can Petraeus be pressured to do things? Of course he can. He still has a political threshold to maintain. He still has duties and responsibilities. He still has a mandate. No, I believe he's just a person. If he were any of these other entities... They would bow to him. They're not bowing to him. That's not what they're doing. These other things, believe me when I tell you they get their way. Among their own, among just normal people, they get their way. They get their way. Somebody said, what? Wait a minute, I saw that, Robin. Hold on. Let me go back. Somebody, I didn't even know about uh, Ricky till recently, but I've always seen the energy field around me and others. I want to ask if anyone know anything about being able to see Aurora and gener generate. Okay, listen. Listen, everybody listen. Listen to me. Listen to me. I want all of you, right? Because a lot of people, they see things around people, Right? You'll see something around every object on the face of the earth except for what I'll call an absent object. An absent object does not emanate life. It absorbs it, right? So that means if you look at a tree line indirectly, you're going to see a kind of like a halo around it. If you look at people, you're going to see the same thing around it. What filters that out is a person refusing to see things. Once a person... If they just simply look at something to see what it is without judgment or anything else, you're going to start to see the halo around anything that emanates light. Every human being on earth can do that. Every human being. Now, does that mean there's a field around a person? Well, of course, there's. A, everybody has a magnetic field. Everybody has a bio field around them. right? But it does not necessarily mean it's something special. That's not what it means. It's something that everybody has. Tree lines have them around them, right? If you look at a tree line indirectly, you're going to start seeing that. And some people have big, bright ones, and some people have dim ones, right? You can see that. If you look at a person for who they are, in other words, don't think about your disbelief. Don't think about any of that stuff. Just start to see a person for who they are, and you'll see it. You'll see it around every living thing. You will not see it around those objects that absorb life. You will see it around objects that emanate life or reflect life. That's part of your vision. Because believe it or not, your vision can pick up a special part of the spectrum that emanates a wavelength, and it's in that wavelength. You can actually see that with your eyes. You can. Kind of like it, kind of like it's, it's, it's somewhat like you see it at the at an angle. You always see it at an angle. Right? But you can see it nevertheless. Just like you can look. If you pick out any blue part of the sky and you focus at that one blue part of the sky, you can start seeing particulates or cells move in your eyeballs. You can do that inward focus that much to where you can start to see cells moving in your eyeballs. That you can see too. Right? We're not talking about stars. We're talking about cells. That's different. If you start seeing stars, go get some water. But we're talking about cells moving. So that's no that's not a that's not some special thing. That's something anybody can do. What people are doing this day and age is because no one is talking about it. You gotta be careful. They're making up subjects out there in the world where they worship energy and they worship all this stuff that they're rediscovering. 
Some of us old crusty ones, we already knew about that stuff. Some of these new people, right, they take advantage of it, give it another name, and then they have people thinking that somehow if they fold their arms and put their pinky finger up their nose, they can start seeing, you know, all this fancy stuff. Not how that happens. These are, these are natural things that a person can do. So, but there are lots of natural things a person can do. It's just that there's a whole generation that is disconnected from some of the knowledge that is already out there. And so they're making up a whole new knowledge base. You've got to be careful in that. You've got to be very careful, extremely careful. Some of these new uh, things that people are coming up with, people, I'm telling you, people are going to end up worshiping Kermit the Frog here shortly if it continues. Now, that would be bad, right? You don't want to see people worship Kermit the Frog. And that would be horrifically terrible. So anyway, that's what we're having. You know, that, that's what's happening. Somebody says, uh, somebody's upset. Just in Mixler right now, guys, when somebody comes in there unruly, just call them out to me. And I'll load up Mixler and... Um, Unfortunately, with Mixler, the only thing you can do is give them the boot. Hopefully, they, you know, can calm down, but sometimes in Mixler, we don't control certain aspects of Mixler, so if you point them out, I'll just, I have no choice but to give them the boot because of distraction. We don't want distraction, that stuff in there. That's not why we're doing this. We're not doing this to compete. We're not doing this for any other reason than to assist folks, right? Not to tear people down. If people want to tear folks down, there's lots of chat rooms out there where they can do that. This just is not that place, right? You guys can also ignore that person. I would recommend in Mixler that you ignore folks who do such things. Just ignore them, right? Because, you're listen, you're always going to have somebody that comes in a public forum, especially like Mixler, right? That's going to do stuff like that. So you right-click and ignore them. Just ignore them. Always do that. Always ignore them. And that's in Mixler. And COT will handle things a different way. But when they come into Mixler, anybody can access Mixler, right? You just ignore them. Don't subject yourselves to that stuff. Don't feed into the drama, right? Get away from that drama stew. Some people, they come in angry, upset. Sometimes you'd be surprised how many people have come in doing that. I mean, they become some of the most loyal people you've ever seen in your life. So you don't really know, right? Me, I, I honestly expect in any public forum a person who's messed up to be guided um, to a place possibly where they can be fed. Now, you have to go through a thousand to get to the one. You've got to remember that. There's always going to be people out there that will do specific things. But not all of those people, right, are terrible. Maybe having a bad day, bad year, bad something. Sometimes a person wants to talk, and they don't have a good etiquette language. And so every other word is a not-so-good word, right? It's common speech to them. It takes the Holy Spirit to know the difference between the two. Right? So ignore them. But admins, point them out to me. Can you do that? Just point them out to me, admins. And that way we can, you know, kind of follow up on it to see what's happening. You kind of do that. But if everybody ignores them, they, they can draw no attention. If somebody comes in there for nefarious reasons and they're just trying to draw attention out the other direction, just ignore them. That's all you have to do. And they cannot get traction. Right? And they can. They can't get traction in there. All right. Somebody says, can you give us an update on Damascus or Israel? Yes. Iran is prepping a brand new level of hostilities against Israel. They were looking for a direct excuse. And so they're going to bolster people around them. I want you guys to keep Daniel 11 in mind when it says this, this individual is going to go back to his country. He's going to have intelligence with him. That forsakes the Holy Covenant. In other words, a way to betray Israel, a way to throw Israel under the bus. But this time he'll also have intelligence with them, plural, who forsake the Holy Covenant. So everybody who does not like Israel in the Middle East, um, you can expect a 
a growing hostile posture against Israel. Right? You can also expect that they will go into Israel very soon, very, very soon. But hear me on this. In order for them to effectively go into Israel and take Jerusalem, they have to have America uh, under siege. Do you guys understand that? See, that's what, that's what's going to make this year very different. Everybody right now is already overtasked to a degree. And they really can't talk. DHS and FBI and all these guys, they're not going to talk about that. I know it's an election year, but they are overtasked. In other words, things are happening within the USA, Germany, the UK, France, and all these other places. So much so, it's starting to tie people up. There are too many things to track. They know that somebody's going to make a big move in the Middle East against Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu knows that. And when it happens, we already know the outcome that the world is going to cling to them with flatteries. Right now, they're saying, Israel, you got to back off. You're doing too much. Pretty soon, they're going to say, oh, we're going to help you as soon as we can get this past the U.N., as soon as we can discuss this, that, and the other. But by that time, Israel will be under siege. You, there's a very high probability that you live in the very moment when Israel is invaded. You are alive in that moment right now. Right now. So the hostilities of Iran have gone up a notch today. That is today. The war front, is, it, it looks pretty, um, it looks bleak. In other words, it looks like we're not going to avoid the, comp the, the um, confrontations. We're just not going to avoid that. Things are building up beyond management, right? When you start having too many people deployed like that, somebody's going to make a mistake. Somebody will. Somebody says, uh, let's see, San Diego reports all tips over, or they just won't let it happen. Mike, is the U.S. Navy find a reason to move all their assets out of, out of uh, Coronado National Center? San Diego? No, they have, um, believe it or not, submarines are one of the biggest assets right now. And some of the major, some of the major, 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 major things, they've already moved out. They've been gone. This is month number two. Month two. They kind of snuck some things out. If you go back a couple months, they snuck some things out then, right? Which means when you're dealing with uh, machinery, it, it's always a chess game, right? Anything civilian sees, they know that the enemy sees. And so they will often do things prior to uh, having everybody's optics visible or working. So two months ago, some maneuvers took place. Some of those ships never came back. Those just so happen to be the important ones, and the important ones. Um, some of the new class submarines that we use, too, are perfect command and control centers uh, for naval operations. So there you are. But, but can a Pearl Harbor happen again? Yes, in, in, in two places on both coastlines. You better believe it. You better believe it. Would they allow or would they sacrifice certain vessels? Yes, they would have to. Because if the U.S. takes a hit, it will bolster support from, a, from those, you know, allied nations. If we do not take a hit, we're not going to get that much support, will we? So, unfortunately, it takes a country taking a hit to bolster support of other countries. Right? The people are not going to go for it unless damage is incurred. If somebody attacked the USA but left no holes in the ground, then they would say, well, they attacked us, but they didn't do anything, so we shouldn't do anything back to them. That's how people think these days. So, unfortunately, in this day and age, if somebody's going to attack us, we have to let them damage some things, right? So the populace will get behind the policy. If the people are not behind the policy, there's going to be a very different problem. Right. Whenever you go to war, you got to have people behind that policy. You got to. If you don't have people behind the policy in this day and age, no one wants to entertain that idea. Right. So what does that mean, though? In order for us to get involved in something, we're going to have to have a couple of Pearl Harbors. That means we got to sacrifice the machinery. Right. That means. Something unfortunate has to happen in this country that is not something made up, but something real and something that, uh, you know, people are just going to have to live with. Now, 
What this means is this. In order to move the people, it takes the death of people to do that. You guys reading between the lines? It takes the death of people, not only equipment, but the death of people. You're going to have parents who grieve their sons and daughters. Just telling you how it is. You're going to have that type of sentiment within this country. Because we all know, right, if something blew up in this country, it, that may last for a couple of weeks, and then it's going to burn itself out, and no one's going to care, and then they're going to be back to business as usual. But when somebody grieves a child, that's a different story. Correct? I don't want to use that S word, um, but that's coming up, especially with this eclipse in tow. I do not believe uh, anything is going to happen on the eclipse. I do believe they're going to use it because they use all these celestial times for sacrifices. I hate to use that word, but there it is. So, I believe, I believe that will be a time of sacrifice. They've already completed one ritual. The one ritual, um, when a person burns themselves, right? That is part of a ritual that sets the demonic entities loose. The one that goes with it is this, almost like a declaration of a sealing, right? You start to seal certain people for occupation of those demonic entities. Remember something. To, to, to free a bunch of demonic entities is nothing. Demons can't do anything unless they're in people. So to get a demon in a person, you have to have a person be in a compromised position to accept revenge. Once that happens, those demons that have been loosed can then go to their assigned places. Anybody who seeks revenge has opened a door to demonic entities. Now, in order for people to really seek revenge, we have to have a happening in this country that will be worthy of revenge. You guys read between the lines? I can't be too direct because that would be, I would, you know, I'm being as direct as possible. You guys should be able to get this. You should see exactly where I'm going with this, right? The one ritual is already done. They have to seal it, though. Those demonic entities need somewhere to go. And so they have to have a bunch of people instantly have revenge in their hearts. When that happens, right, when that truly takes place and there's grieving involved, there's going to be full occupation of these spirits, and then we go to another level of darkness. All right? Just so you have that. Now you have it. There it is. Can solar earth polarities be accurately predicted? Yes. If so, let's see. Yes, they can. If so, let's see. How far in advance? Well, that depends. That depends on who has the experience tracking uh, certain things. But I would say up to 90, 90 days. About 90. 90 days in advance. And the only limitation on that, right, the only limitation on that is, is wisdom. That's it, wisdom. Because sometimes you, you can't help but to miss taking into account uh, certain things. It, it's just like building a circuit, right? When you build a circuit, any engineer out there that designs a circuit, they know the trace widths and everything they need to maintain current. Uh, what the tolerances are for each component, what the heat factor is, thermal properties, blah, 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 blah. They know what all that is. They, all that has to be calculated. Our solar system is the same way. It is so precise that you can make calculations just like that to come up with the quirkiest things. For, let me give you guys an example. Right? Is anybody saying we're going to have a, another flare in the next two days? Anybody saying anything like that? So that puts it where? Um, on, a, on the second or third, or around third or fourth, right? Is anybody saying we're going to have a flare on the third or fourth? Anybody? Nobody. Is is anybody is anybody talking about the um, 
the one of the what everybody's going to be talking about that sub sub ocean eruption that takes place. You know how when smoke comes out of the ocean, right? And there's no landmass there. No, no, nobody's talking about that. No, nobody's talking about. It. Nobody is talking about that. Nobody suspects it, right? So when you have knowledge in certain areas, right? And you start to apply that knowledge uh, towards understanding processes of the earth. You have to take it upon yourself to build teams, to build whatever you have to build. Uh, because then now you may have the know-how, but uh, you, you still have to go through countless simulations and this and the other uh, to extract that stuff. Unless the Lord gives it to you. Right? If the Lord were to give it to me, which sometimes he has, it's been right on the money. If I have to calculate that stuff, it takes a, takes a lot of time, right? But nobody has given a solar eruption, well, except for folks here at COT, uh, you know, two months in advance or a month in advance. Nobody has ever done that, right? Because they believe it's impossible to do. They don't, they believe it's impossible. Um, a lot of people with celestial mechanics, uh, even orbital issues, right? They don't believe certain things are possible because they don't know the general makeup of what's actually out there. They only believe what they've been told. Well, it just so happens God has people in place that they know what they've had hands on with. And it's beyond what anybody has been told, right? Half the stuff up there in space you cannot see, right? Anybody who reads any of the data, so to speak, they're, they're reading it from people who provide this from the agencies themselves free to everybody on the Internet. And I'm telling you right now, that data is scrubbed. So you're only allowed to see what they want you to see, period. You're not going to see the anomalistic things that would really open the door to things, right? They're not making errors. They have about, they have, believe me, in, in, as far as time goes, calculation scrubbing and filters Every single time you see a live view of the sun or a space or something like that through the Internet, right? And now I'm giving you a comparison. They have the equivalent of 10 days to scrub the data. That happens within seconds, of course. But all that data is scrubbed. All of it's scrubbed. They're not presenting you the raw data. No one gets the raw data. Right? They're not giving the raw data. They're not doing that. They're just not doing that. Uh, if they did, then a lot more Christians would be educated concerning the real makeup of, of uh, what's above your heads. Right? Even the makeup of the atmospheres of Earth. But they're not going to do that. They're not. They're gonna, and I'm trying. See, what I try to do is put up another sensor array so people can have it all the time. See, they don't have to rely upon all these other places that may or may not give you the missing data chunks that you really need to forecast things. I need that available to anybody and everybody who would want to use it. That's what I need. That's exactly what I need, especially in the days to come. With temperatures in America reaching 130 degrees, don't you think somebody's going to need some extra data? They're not telling people about that storm that's forming. They're not, they're not warning people about Florida. They're not telling people about the East Coast issues. They're not telling people about any of this stuff. The forecasters, they have a gag order in effect. It's almost like they're scared to talk about storms, right? They'll only start talking about the hail, probably um, starting from this morning on. They didn't talk about the hail yesterday. We're going to have record breakers this year. This year is going to be devastating in a lot of ways. Infrastructure can't take it. It's going to be rough, right? Very rough. So they're, they're I don't know, is, um, if you knew what was happening to them, because they don't look happy at what they're doing, do they? Meteorologists, they don't look happy doing what they're doing. They don't. Because they can't talk about everything. And it's scaring them to pieces. 
Well, somebody's got you guys have to be informed. You do. Also have a habit of staying away from the noise of the Internet. Sometimes things are ballooned in the Internet. And if uh, during those times people gravitate towards the most sensational thing out there. And until it fails, kind of like the eclipse, until this stuff, the eclipse fails, we can't discuss the eclipse. It will go through one ear and out the other. Right? Uh, somebody wrote me and said, you know, is the world going to end on the eclipse? Oh, no, no, no. And that, and that. These are signals. I believe in the biblical aspect of these things. Right? I do. So, that's where we are with that. At any rate. Once all that passes, we can get back to uh, back to what we normally do, right? I feel more comfortable with that. Now, spiritual things concerning the eclipse, pay attention to those things. Pay attention. I do not believe, uh, it, you know, that the world's going to end. Or a lot of people are saying we're going to have three days of darkness. <laughs> I hate to tell you guys, I, I don't subscribe to that prophecy. That prophecy, I know where it came from, right? Was there three days of darkness in the past? Yes, there was. But I don't subscribe to uh, some of the prophecies out there that came from certain origins, right? The same person who had that prophecy of the three days of darkness had 19 other prophecies that failed. Hope you guys know that. And there you got people hanging on to the three days of darkness. No, that that was uh, that was based in Catholicism a long time ago. It started a long time ago. Where you, where the only thing that would work during that time are candles. That's based in Catholicism from a specific individual, right? So I can't subscribe to that. I can't do that. Now, was there three days of darkness in Egypt? Yes, there was. But when we're talking about prophecy, I was given something, but it's not three days of darkness. I was given something totally different than what everybody else was given. And you guys at COT, you know what that is. 30 and 7 days. That's what I was given. Not three days. 30 and 7 days. Like any updates on the attack next to the Iranian, in, well, it has caused a stink, that's for sure. And Iran is not happy with it. They have about vowed revenge, period. Um, was it purposed? Of course it was. Israel's not playing. You know what? From the beginning of COT, I told you guys, Israel is a hornet's nest, and they're able to back up quite a bit. They're actually utilizing great restraint. They really are utilizing great restraint. Their restraint's not going to last forever. It's not going to last for long. But right now they're exercising massive restraint. Massive restraint. There will come a time when they no longer do that. And, uh, well, I guess people are going to find out the hard way. Now, does that mean Israel is not going to be captured? They will. They will be subdued for three and a half years. They will. For three and a half years they're going to be subdued. Um, but that's how that is. That's how it is. So that's prophecy. It's prophecy right there. But for right now, uh, tensions have escalated. Iran has vowed revenge. Revenge. Somebody says, just Jerusalem? Yes, just Jerusalem, which means they're going to take all of Israel. They're going to take it over. Jerusalem would be a, a word that you use to emphasize th the spiritual taking and the physical taking of a place. They want to die, then dropped in. Sorry, it froze them. Somebody said, is that the same where people would cry out, they don't want to die, then dropped in? Sorry, it froze them. Yeah, I could hear the rest of what you said earlier. I'm told. Uh, yeah, I, I missed the whole time you were talking about. There will come a time when people won't be able to die, right? Um, the 30 and 7 days, however, is bitter. Can you imagine no light for 30 
Seven days. Are you? I mean, no light. Zip zero none. There's a darkness coming that you'll be able to feel. I can tell you that too. It'll be like touching oil. If you were to reach out and touch it, it'd be like putting your hand in oil. Right in the sky, that's coming. That is coming. Someone says, Mike, did you see CERN's website lately? No, not lately. Not lately. I have their, uh, their uh, calendar, though, and some of their memos come through. What about CERN? Should we be concerned? Well, even if you were concerned, what can you do? What can you do? I can assure you that everybody can see CERN. So how concerned be the issue when everybody knows about it? They're telling you what they're doing at CERN, but I'll tell you right now, if you can, if the world can see it, it is not the concern. Might want to keep your eye on Kennedy, though. You know where the rockets launch? Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy. It begins there. It will begin there. You'll understand that when it happens. But it will begin there in Kennedy's. Why would they name it Kennedy? Anyway, folks, I'm going to leave you guys with that. Listen, I'm going to get these uh, KD files published so you guys can see them. Because I was vetting them, or uh, actually going through a lot of them. And I hope you guys learn from them. I do. Hope you guys learn from them. Tomorrow, tomorrow, we're going to talk, we're going to have a summary on the open seals tomorrow all right hopefully you guys are there uh wednesday that's when the kd files you guys will be able to access the first preliminary parts of those wednesday and and forward um right after wednesday i'm going to be working close with the admins we have a lot of groundwork to do for you guys right and then next week coming up we're going to try the impossible. Something has to take the place of AI for four days. I got to shut down AI in COT, right? That means some people are going to have to physically monitor chat rooms that we have out there. Next week, we'll gather up some uh, takers for that. We'll see how many our admins can handle. I'll show them how to do that. But uh, I'm going to have to take AI down for about eight hours. And during that time... Uh, it won't assist a soul. It won't assist anybody. So we'll have we'll need some people who plug in with AI who can do, I'm going to have to build something where they can do the same thing AI does, or should it be you know needed at the time. But we'll, we'll see if we can do that. Uh, we'll start that next week. Maybe it's too impossible. I may have to rethink the whole thing. But we'll see. We'll see. Somebody says, I'm, I'm confused about the difference of belief. Difference of beliefs of what? They have places where cops and scientists can't go, yes. That's New York. New York is becoming a... New York is politically charged. And it seems like, you know, all those different places in New York are starting to feel the pressure of that, right? It is politically charged, and it does span the world. It does. We know that Jews, in every place they are, they're going to be a beacon here shortly. I, I just pray that you guys take that path of God's peace, I do. Somebody says, will there be a biological attack? When? When? You guys know that during the eclipse, all those people clustered together? I don't really trust that, which is why they're going to they're gonna really increase security. To have all those people together, if something should happen. We've had mass shooters. We've had people, people try to be bold enough to actually try and just run their trucks into the, you know, federal buildings and things all around the 
world this stuff is happening, right? So we know we have enemies against the USA, domestic enemies too. If all those people are gathered during the eclipse, somebody, you already, you know and I know that somebody is going to take full advantage of that. You know it and I know it. So I don't know about you. My prayers are for those folks. They're not going to listen. They're not going to listen to any anything like that that's going to stop them from having their fascinating time. But you know and I know there's some bad actors here in America who are going to take full advantage of that eclipse. You already know that. You know that. As Mattis standard, suppose somebody does release something, they're going to be sniffing the entire time during this eclipse. They have to, because it can be so easy to release something, right? We already have enough vials and containers missing. It can be so easy, so those people are going to be sniffing the entire time. My goodness. Right in front of the whole world, sniffing away, trying to find, Right? I know one person will remember something I said about that because an evacuation took place right after that. Right after some men and women were sniffing. Were sniffing with the hazmat gear. They were sniffing white hazmat gear. They were sniffing. Right after that, a mandatory evacuation took place and people were headed west fast. Yep, they were. Anyway, folks, can't give away too much. We'll keep everything in context. I hope to see some of you guys here shortly right here in the chat room in COT. I'm getting back in the driver's seat. My goodness, i got to figure some things out quick, code-wise. God bless each of you. Thank you guys for joining me. I do love the questions, by the way. Remember, tomorrow, tomorrow, we're going to be in a, a review. Are the seals open is the major question. Are the seals open? All right, so bring your honest opinions, right? And be ready. Be ready, be ready, be ready. God bless each of you. I'm going to see you guys next time right here at the Council of Time. God bless.